And then there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. Fire is amazing. The Holy Spirit shows up in wind and in fire, and fire is kind of terrifying. When our kids were little, Jesse was probably about seven or eight, we had him go in the, uh, the garage and actually, um, I, I don't know, what, turn off a light. I don't know what we had him do. In the process, we had a heat lamp going. He knocked the heat lamp over, didn't realize he did it, came in the house. The heat lamp was by paint, and it caught everything on fire. Thankfully, our other son was in his room. He started smelling smoke, seeing smoke, and he was panicked, went out, opened the door, and everything's on fire. So he, he somehow finds Rob, where do you think I am? Bubble bath. Okay. He comes banging on my door. Mom, the house is on fire. Okay. I'm paralyzed. I'm like, what do I do? Get dressed might be a good idea. <laughs> that might be rule number one. But I had no idea because there's something so frightening about fire because you know it takes everything in its wake when it goes. And I didn't even know where to begin. Do I call the fire department? Do I get my pictures together? I just had no idea. And here the disciples saw tongues of fire above their heads. And they probably had no idea what that meant. But here's the really good news. It rested on every single one of them. 120 people. I'm going to assume if you and I were in that room and we saw Peter, James, John, Andrew, Bartholomew, we'd be like, you know what? The fire is going to go on them. If we were in a room and Billy Graham was here and Andy Stanley and your pastor and my pastor, we would just assume the tongues of fire would go upon them. Because somehow we think that it's our pastor's job or your Bible study or your youth group leader, it's their job to go out and, and have a job. It's, they're the ones that are, are, have the Holy Spirit in them. And that is not true. I found a picture that sort of looked like tongues of fire. You have one in front of you. This is what I want you to do. I want everybody to take their picture and I want you to put it above your head, just like this. This is what it would have looked like on the day of Pentecost. Look at this. How cool is that? And we're looking around going, oh my gosh, you have tongues of fire. I have tongues of fire. This is so cool. What does that mean? And this is what it means. You and I are all anointed. We have a job, okay? We, we, we have a job. You're supposed to go into your neighborhoods and your place of work, and it's your job. You are anointed to go in and do something for the gospel. Now, some of you hate that. You kind of took this and you're like, yep, I'm going to hide it, okay? Because it scares you. There was a young lady who met with an evangelist one time. And she said, I don't want to fully give my life to Jesus because I'm terrified. She said, my greatest fear is that God will send me to be a missionary in China. Now, I get that. There's a lot of smog in China and, and I, there's a lot of fish and I don't like either. But here's what he said to her. He said, if some cold, snowy morning, a little bird should come to your window, half frozen, and seeking shelter, would you, if it lets you take it in, would you bring it in, feed it, therefore putting, putting uh, the little bird, him putting himself in your care, um, would, would, what would you do? Would you take the bird and slam it on the ground? Would you take the bird and, 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 and step on it, pull its wings off? Would, would you be mean to it? And suddenly she was like, oh my gosh, I have a whole bad, wrong view of God. And he said, you're right. God is a loving God. He's not going to send me to Africa. He knows I like bubble baths and running hot water. He just won't do that. Now, if he wants me there, guess what? He's changing my heart. And he's going to make me so excited to go to Africa, I don't feel like calling on my life, so until he does, I'm not going to worry about it. But here's what happens. Two years later, she met the same evangelist. She came up to him and she said, I don't know if you remember our conversation. This is what you told me. And she laughed. She said, you're not going to believe this, but guess where God's sending me to? With a smile, she said, China. And see, it's a whole different thing. When you decide to fully devote your life to Jesus, it's like, God, I'll go anywhere, but you've got to give me the desire and the heart. So many people think God's so mean. He's just going to send us to some foreign country. He's not going to do that. He's going to, like, I'm amazed at the people who go, I want to go to Iran and work with Muslims. I'm like, are you kidding? Like, I would never do that. But people are called to do different things. God loves us. For most of us, he's just sending us to the neighborhoods and the workplace that we're at. 
Most of us aren't going to have to get sent overseas, but we, we've got to get a proper view of God and know that he'll change our hearts. Now, we see tongues of fire and we wonder, okay, what does that mean? And so we look back in the Old Testament and we say, where did we see fire before? And of course we saw it in the burning bush with Moses. And I want you to think about Moses' life back then. Because Moses was an Israelite. He was a Hebrew. He was... Um, he, he lived in the palace. He was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. So he, he knew he was, had his roots in Israel. Um, and he knew he believed in the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he, he knows all of this, but he lives in the palace. So one day he's walking along and he sees um, a, 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 the Egyptian killing a Hebrew, uh, an Israelite. And it makes Moses mad, so he kills the Egyptian. Well, now he goes on the run. And now Moses is 70 years old, and he's living in this wilderness in the back part of the mountains, tending sheep. He used to live in the palace. Now he's tending sheep. And it's monotonous, and it's boring, and every day he does the same thing, and he's 70 years old, and he's just waiting to die. And he's just biding his time, just like, yep, wake up, feed the sheep, walk them around, put them to bed, do the same thing over and over and over again. And here's what dawned on me. He believed in God. I think most people would say they believed in God. I think most Christians would say, well, of course I believe in Jesus. But you know what? He was doing nothing with his life. Nothing. And I honestly think that that's what the church, the state of the church is like now. People show up at church. They say they believe in Jesus. But there's no fire there's no excitement. There's no purpose in their life whatsoever. They're just, no, I believe in God. And they're just waiting to die. And, and, and then God shows up in a fire that never burns out. And we learn this, that, that nothing in our life is ever going to fulfill us unless we're working for God. We see this in, 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 um, in Solomon's life. Solomon was the richest, supposedly wisest. I'm losing him on the wise thing because he does some really stupid stuff. But he's the richest man in the world. Some of you are here saying, if I just had lots of money, I would be fine. No, it wouldn't satisfy you. Solomon did everything. Look at verse 2. This is his conclusion. Everything is meaningless. This is from the richest man in the world. He said, um, completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come, generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and it sets and it hurries around again. The wind blows south and then turns north, around and around, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea. The sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again in the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are never content. And you're like, well, just try me. Well, here's his story. He decides to go and be a builder because I think building will make me happy. So he builds his house and he builds his barns and he builds his gardens and he builds all this stuff. And you know what happens? He says, yeah, it's all meaningless. Then he decides that he's going to go try to have fun. He wants to laugh, so he goes to parties and he drinks and he, 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 he goes to comedy clubs. And you know what? It's all meaningless. By the time he gets home, it's over. And then he decides to get a bunch of girlfriends and a bunch of wives. Well, that certainly wasn't going to work for him. That clearly didn't make him happy. One wife's enough for Rob. Could you imagine like 20 or 400 or whatever Solomon had? But here's the deal, because what Solomon ends his life saying is this, unless you have a purpose, and the purpose is working for God, I don't care what your dream is. You have this beautiful dream of your life that you want to do this and that. If you aren't doing it to serve God, you will be miserable all your life. That's just the way it is. The Bible tells us that. So there's where we see Moses. He's just biding his time, wondering what to do, and God brings him a fire. And, 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 and suddenly in this fire, this is my paraphrase here, God says to Moses, Moses, what are you doing out here? I did not create you to live in this semi-retired stage until you just die out here in the middle of the wilderness with some sheep. He said, Moses, while you are out here doing this, basically doing nothing for your faith, he said, my people, which by the way, Moses, are your people, are suffering in Egypt. They're in bondage to Pharaoh. They're slaves. They're, they're dying. They're working seven days a week, 23 hours a day. Like, this is a bad deal, Moses. I need you to get in the game. 
And so when we see a fire in the Old Testament, it's because God has a job for Moses. And we see fire in the New Testament, and he's reminding you and I that we have a job also. We've got to get in the game. Because now it's a new era. And so many of us just go to church, and we complain. It's too hot. It's too cold. I didn't like the pastor today. Lisa was really boring today. Like whatever it is, and, and, and instead of doing something, we're just like complaining, and we're just miserable. And God is just up there going, hello, I brought you a fire to show you that it's, yes, go to church. It's to learn something so that you can go out into the world and do something with what you learned. It's not about you. It's not about me. But Christians believe that. They think it's all about me and my happiness. And this section today says, no, it's not. It's about knowing Jesus and rescuing people. And so he gives us these physical manifestations of fire and of wind because he wants us to know he's got spiritual life he's breathed into us. And now we have the fire to be able to go out and do what we need to do. And he breathed life into it, and the fire of God came upon them and touched every single believer. And you and I are no exception here. God wants to use you in the place that he has set you. But God will never be able to do that if we are like Moses, where we're just biding our time until we die. Showing up at church, believing in God, blah, 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 blah. It's not going to happen. He's not going to use us until we surrender and say, God, my life is yours. Where do you want me? And if you want me to go to Africa, you want me to go to Iran, you want me to go to China, God, you're going to have to just give me a love for those people. Most often, he's not trying to send you across the world. He's trying to send you across your street to your neighbor. We have got to stop being so self-absorbed as Christians and stop quenching, quenching, quenching the Holy Spirit. I want us to be like Moses who saw the fire and didn't run away. He saw the fire, he walked up to it, he inquired about it, and then he obeyed. There was a young pastor who was called to a small town in Iowa. He tried for several months to move this church into understanding what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. He visited them, he worked on his sermons, he did everything he could. And finally he realized one day his his church was dead. And so he placed a notice in the local newspaper stating that since the church was dead, he was going to have a proper burial for it. Everybody showed up. When they got there, they saw in front of the church a large casket covered with flowers. He read the eulogy. He he gave this brilliant sermon on how the church died. And he said then he invited the congregation to step forward and pay their last respects and walk by the casket. And as they did, they looked into the casket and were shocked when they saw a huge mirror. And as they walked back, they saw their face in the casket. Because they are the church. And you and I are the church. He said the following Sunday, the congregation all showed back up again. But this time they realize something. We are the body of Christ. It is about rescuing souls. It is about reading the Bible. It's about praying for people. It's about us being a body of Christ so that we can go out and share something and be unified so we can get out into the world. I heard the saddest thing yesterday. I had lunch with a couple of girls, and one of the girls said she worked in, um, up in Washington, D.C., She ended up working for church after she worked for the government or whoever she worked for at that time. And she said, at the time, the church split. And she said it was so bad and so ugly that she had to go back out into the world and get a job because it was worse in the church than it was in the world. And that broke my heart. I said, what is wrong with us? I'm saying this for me, too. I have my own issues. But here's what I want us to realize, is that you and I are part of this team, and we are on a rescue mission. We'll end here. Shepherds look at Psalm 23, Philip Keller. He said when he first bought his his sheep, he understood that he would need to be a shepherd, a really good shepherd. So he made this beautiful grass field, and he had fresh water, and he had places for his sheep to go when when the wind was bad and it was cold and snowy, and he took care of them with, with, with everything in him. 
Down the road, there was another shepherd, and he was a bad shepherd. He never took care of his sheep. They, the sheep foraged on, on brown grass. They, they got sick. The, the water was muddy, and they couldn't get out. And they could look over, and they could see this beautiful green lush field with a shepherd who took care of his sheep. And, and Philip Keller says, it just reminded me that, that we live in that kind of a world where people are under the, the rule and the thumb of Satan, a really bad shepherd. And all they can do is look out and see that we have peace and joy. A lady came up to me today and said she just lost her son last week. She said, you know what I have, Lisa? Peace. People don't have that. They just don't. They live anxious, scared, fearful lives over there. And yet they look over and they see us and we have something. It's our job to go rescue them and bring them to the Good Shepherd.